Why didn't I think of that? This week, I was having a conversation with our project manager from our, the, the, the construction company that's getting ready to start the big remodel in our church. And we, we have some different issues that we're going through. One is that we had some AC units, some air conditioning units that were vandalized a while back. And so there's an insurance claim, but that then simultaneously we're doing construction that's going to be adding some, uh, some AC units. And so it's all sort of complex. And I was just trying to figure out what's the best way to, to we, we want to be reimbursed for those things that were vandalized. We have been partially reimbursed already, but just trying to figure out like, how does this fit with the remodel? And I was kind of stressing about it. And I was talking with our project manager from the construction company, Marshall. And, and I was telling him about all this stuff, and, and it, I was like, oh, but this, but this, but this other thing. And he goes, Garen, why don't you just ask the insurance company what they want to do? And I just went, oh, yes, that's so simple. Why didn't I think of that? And just the way I felt when I heard that just wise suggestion, I just sort of breathed and felt peace where I was stressed. And I, I was just so encouraged about that. And I, I wonder if you've ever had that experience where maybe you were, you've been t you were talking to your dad or an older sibling or your boss or your teacher or something. You were talking to someone that you respect and you had this problem, this thing you're trying to figure out. And you told them about it and you just thought, man, I don't know if I should do this or, I, or that. And the person just says, da, 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 this wise thing. And you just go, oh, yeah right. I'll do that. That's great. It seems like what we need is wisdom. And we are in a series. Uh, last week I, I started, I kind of went to the end of the series last week, but this is kind of the official formal beginning of this series. Words of wisdom from the book of Proverbs. So in the Bible, I know the Bible is one book, but it's made up of many books. And that's one of the ways that we know that it's a God-breathed book because the, the, the books, the sections of the Bible were written by many different authors over thousands of years, and they all have one theme. Man is lost, and God wants to save you. It's the theme of salvation. It goes from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. So when I say the book of Proverbs, it's a section within the Bible. All right, so that, that's, that's what I mean by that. So if there was ever a day that we needed wisdom, it is today. Am I right? Like, we need God's wisdom today. We have access to more information than we've ever had. At the, just at the, with a click of a mouse, man, we can know everything, it seems like, today. And yet, we're more confused than ever about even the most basic things of life, people are confused. They, they don't know what to do about it. They don't, they don't know about identity. They don't know about worship. They don't know about authority. There's so much confusion today, even though we have so much information. Wouldn't it be great if you could just go to a book and find wisdom? Good news, you can. It's the Bible. And then within the Bible, the, the book of Proverbs is part of what we call wisdom literature. And so if you need wisdom, and we all need wisdom, for what to decide, how to talk, how to live, how to vote, if you need wisdom, go to God's Word. The book of Proverbs is, is a great place to start. So would you turn, if you, if you have a Bible or you have a Bible on your device, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 1, very first chapter, and we'll, we'll read 1, 1 through 7. So what is, a, what is a proverb? A proverb is just simply a short statement of truth in a memorable way. So it's, it, is a, it is meant to be remembered and used in your life. So Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 is the introduction to the book. And this is what it says. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Okay, so who, what, what are we talking about here? So we're talking about God's people 
he chose Israel among all the nations of the world. He chose them to bring his son Jesus through. So it, 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 is, a, it is a special group of people. And the cool thing is that you and I are now part of spiritual Israel. If you've put your faith in Jesus, now you are one of God's children. You're one of his people. All right, so we're actually included. So when we study Israel's history, the reason we do that is because what we're doing, we're studying the history of how God interacts with people. And we're people who want to interact with God. Amen? Amen? Oh, good. Okay, there's at least three of us that are people that want to interact with God. We're people that want to interact with God. Amen? Amen. That's right. Yeah, I knew, I knew we, we all did. So Solomon is, is the third king of Israel, and he was King David's son. His father was a national hero long before he was king. He was a national hero. Have you ever heard of David and Goliath? This, this young guy, David, slayed the giant Goliath who was coming against God's people. We sang a worship song today that said, giants are still being slain. It's a reference back to David. So when Solomon, his son, became king, can you imagine the pressure of following a national hero like King David? King David, his father, had written half of the Psalms in the Bible. Wow, can you imagine being the son of a Bible writer? You go, wow, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, and at the same time that he had that pressure, Solomon's brothers all wanted to be king instead of him. And the customary way to do that would be either to grab the throne and put Solomon in jail or just simply to kill him. So he, is, he has got this pressure from behind him, uh, following a dad, a king. That was so amazing. And then brothers that are all trying to do away with them. A couple of them had already declared themselves as king. They had just like snuck off, got a little following and said, I'm going to be king. And this is what Solomon comes into uh, at, when he became king. A lot of pressure on him. But we know this. Solomon was a man who sought the Lord. And he loved God. One day, he sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings in one day, in one time, just to show God, God, I want to extravagantly worship you. I want to love you in a way that you have no doubt I love you. This was an amazing thing that he did when he first became king. Well, that night, the story of Solomon becoming king, in 1 Kings 3, and in verse 5, it says, That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. So that day, he had, Solomon had just sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings. He was not required to do so. He just said, I want to richly worship you. And that night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. And God said, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. So imagine being Solomon with all the pressures that are going on. He's got family trying to take him down. He's got all the, all the pressure of his, his, his history with, with his dad. And he's got the pressure of just being a young king called to rule a nation. And not just any nation, but God's nation. This is a lot of pressure. So this is a lot for anyone to handle. So Solomon could have said, Lord, I want you to kill all my brothers so there's no more threat to the throne. He could have said, Lord, I want you to wipe out all the armies around me. Lord, I want you to give me riches and fame. He could have said any of that, and it would, be, would have been sort of like, kind of expect a king to ask for something like that, but he didn't. In verse 9 and 10, it, it records his prayer. He says, Lord, give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people can, can govern your people well, and so that I can know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? So it's not just like a guy just stepping into luxury going, oh, it's not that big a deal to be king. Everyone just do what I say. Like there's a lot going on here. And Solomon said, Lord, I just want you to help me to know how to please you, 
how to be wise. Help me to have understanding. Help me to know the difference between right and wrong. And the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God, in, in effect, says, yes, yes, I'm going to give you wisdom. In fact, I'm going to give you so much wisdom that you're going to be wiser than anybody else on the planet. And since you didn't ask me for anything selfish, God said, I'm going to go ahead and give you riches and fame like have never been seen before. What a cool thing. So Solomon, he just prays, God, all I want is wisdom to serve you well and lead your people well. God says, great, yes, you got it, plus everything else. Pretty amazing. First Kings chapter 3, verse 14, God said, and if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. So God does ask something of Solomon. He says, I'm going to give you wisdom like no one's ever seen. I'm going to give you riches and fame. You're going to be amazing. Uh, and I'm asking you to do this, Solomon. Follow my decrees. Follow me. Obey me. Do what I've asked you to do. And then I'm going to keep blessing you. Pretty amazing start to this king's uh, uh, reign and rule. So Solomon began to grow in wisdom. And God just imparted wisdom to him. And at some point, he began to write the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is only actually scratching the surface of what uh, Solomon had written in his life. He had written, I, I, uh, it says somewhere, he had written over 3,000 Proverbs. And I think there's maybe like 750 or something like that in the book of Proverbs. So Solomon had so much wisdom. He also like wrote scientific books, classifying things in nature. I mean, he just was so, he, he was an amazing, amazing guy. And so Solomon, at the very beginning of this book of Proverbs, he, he says, I'm going to tell you why I'm writing these down. In, in Proverbs 1, verses 2 and 3, what's the purpose of Proverbs? He says, he tells us, their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. The purpose of the book of Proverbs is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. Man, I don't know about you, but I want that. Anybody else want a life like that? A life where you do what's right and just and fair, where you're self-disciplined and where you are successful. Man, I want that life. And that's what God wants for you. And so we know that the Bible, God's Word, is an inspired book. It is written down using a physical pen pen and ink, you know, however they wrote it over the years. But the Holy Spirit breathed that word through people and into people. It's inspired by God. So this is God's way to live an, a, 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 a successful life. Verse 4 says, these proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. So parents... If you're looking to raise your kids to follow the Lord, find the wisdom for that in the book of Proverbs and just simply teach it to them. That, that is God's plan for wisdom. So parents, the, the wisdom that you need to raise your kids, and it's me, I'm having, I'm having some physical, technical things going here. It should be fine. Let's, let's, let's keep that, yeah, let's keep that up. Okay, I'll, I'll switch. Yes. Uh, so if you want to raise your kids to, to, to live a successful life, teach them the wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Uh, when, when we go to get wisdom, we go to God. We go to his word. We have a lot of opinions. And I've got a lot of opinions. You've got a lot of opinions. Everyone around us has a lot of opinions. But those opinions can be wrong. I don't know if you've ever thought one thing for a long time and then you, then you found the evidence and went, oh, I guess I was wrong about that. But God's word is true. And so 
it's not only good for raising kids, it's great for mentoring people. If you want to mentor people at work, if you want to mentor people to follow Jesus, the wisdom that you need and the wisdom that they need is found in the book of Proverbs. But it's more than just for babes and uh, people that are being mentored. Verse 5 says, but let the wise listen to these Proverbs. So if you're already like, I'm already wise, I got this. Okay, well, let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance. By exploring the meaning in these Proverbs and parables, the words of the wise, the words of the wise and their riddles. So if you're already wise, listen up. The the book of Proverbs has something for you and for me. It has something for everybody in it to help you live a successful life. So for the first 20 years of Solomon's reign, everything was going pretty good. He had peace on every side. By the way, he took care of his brothers. (laughs) No longer no longer a threat to the throne. He, God blessed Solomon with wisdom, and he, he was so wise that people, kings, royalty, wise, wise people from other lands came just to be, uh, be with him, just to ask him questions, just to hear him say stuff, because he was so wise. He built the first Jewish temple, so you might remember that uh, under Moses, they had a tent that was a, a beautiful worship place, but it was a tent. Uh, um, Solomon built the first grand, beautiful, gold-plated, uh, bronze altar temple, uh, and it, it was an amazing, lavish house of worship. He built a magnificent palace and other buildings. He had tons of money. Someone figured this out. His annual salary in today's dollars, annual salary, $328 million. So he was wise beyond compare. He was rich beyond compare. Like, he is just a standout. And in fact, uh, uh, many would say that Jewish people today are praying for a return to the days of Solomon. Like, we want that. That was the glory days when money was flowing and there was peace all around him. So with a, with a king like this, God spoke to him, answered his prayer, gave him everything he wanted, and even more, made him so wise. You would think that this guy would just be on cloud nine 24 seven. He'd probably just be living his best life all the time. And yet at the end of his life, we see some of his writings in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, uh, for example, chapter 2, verse 11, Solomon later wrote, but as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, and he had accomplished some big stuff, it was all so meaningless. It was like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. That's how he felt. He was depressed. How could the guy that's so wise and just wanted to sacrifice everything to the Lord at the beginning of his kingdom, how could that guy become so depressed that at the end of his life, he just looked at everything, all the grand stuff he had done, he just goes, nothing's meaningful. Everything's meaningless. I'm depressed. I'm sad. Everything's just like chasing after the wind. You just can't even catch it. How did he get to that low place? actually very simple. He didn't follow the Lord's commands. That's it. That's a whole story. He knew them all. He wrote them down. He taught people far and wide. He wrote part of the Bible. He had heard from God. And God said, you got to live like this. And if you do, I will bless you. Wow. Wow. He knew God's word, but he didn't apply it to his own life. For example, in the word of God, in the law of God, Deuteronomy 17, 16. By the way, God's word says when, uh, when, when 
there are, when there are kings of Israel, their first job is to write down by hand the entire law, roughly equivalent to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They had to write that down by hand because God wanted to make sure the king knew the law. Deuteronomy 17, 16, hadn't God said the king must not build up a large stable of horses for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses? For the Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. Solomon had 4,000 horse stalls for chariot horses. And he had 12,000 horses that he got from Egypt. And that story is in 1 Kings 4 and 1 Kings 10. God just said, whatever you do, king, make sure you trust in me. Don't lean on your own strength. So whatever you do, don't go back to Egypt where I delivered you from slavery. In Deuteronomy 17, 17, the next verse God's word warned the king. The king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. God typically, when he blesses a person with riches, it is with the intent of flowing through that person to bless others. But we know from the end of his life, Solomon had 700 wives. Oh my goodness. 700 wives of of royal birth, people from other lands, far and wide. And every wife that he took of royal birth was a strategic alliance. It was a way of him saying to other kings, hey, I'm marrying your daughter, so don't ever come after me with your army. Solomon appears to have been so worried that they were going to go down, that he went to extreme measures. But as if that's not enough, he had 300 concubines. So without getting into all the particulars... This was just simply a woman who existed for his pleasure. 300 of them. So Solomon was not only worried about making sure that he did everything he could to keep his kingdom safe, he was also apparently quite a ladies' man. Oh my goodness. And in 1 Kings 11, verse 3, it says, And in the end they did turn his heart away from the Lord. Solomon was so wise, but he did not act wisely. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, Solomon himself wrote, he knew where wisdom comes from. For the Lord, for fear of the Lord is the foundation or the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. So he, Solomon knew this is this is where wisdom comes from. Wisdom comes from God. <laughs> and not only just from God, but from a right relationship with God. The fear of the Lord is the foundation or the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Lord results in good judgment. A person who acts in good judgment is a person with a right relationship with the Lord. There's another verse that is considered the key verse of Proverbs. Proverbs 1, 7. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. We have a very foundational choice in life to make. You have a choice to make. I have a choice to make. And it really, man, the rest of life really builds on this. Wisely fear the Lord and build your life on a relationship with God or ignore the Lord and go your own way. 
Proverbs calls a person who does that a fool. So we, we might say, well, a fool is, is someone who made a bad choice or something. But in Proverbs, that, that word has a little bit broader meaning. It, it, it means someone who turns away from the Lord and despises, in, in essence, what the Lord is asking you to do. The bottom line is this. The Lord makes you wise when you fear him and walk in his ways. The Lord makes you wise when you fear him and walk in his ways. Now, some of you might be new to this word fear in this context. You think, man, I don't want to be afraid of God. I want to love God. Yes. Well, fear in this case, it, it means reverence. It's, it's a feeling of profound respect for God. It's, it's, it's admitting, confessing, believing, God, you're God, I'm not. So this kind of fear is not like I'm going to, I'm, fear makes me run away from God. I don't want to be with God. This fear makes me bow my knee to God. That's the fear that we're talking about. It's, it's, a, it's a fear that says, God, you're king of my life, not me. I'm not king of my life. You are. That's the fear that we're talking about. Now, wisdom, what, what is wisdom in, in these verses? It means it's the ability to apply knowledge or experience or understanding or common sense or insight. It's the ability to apply it. So if you come to me and you say, hey, could you give me some wisdom? It would be me saying, well, the Bible says this, and here's how you apply it to your life. Here's how you walk it out or doing that for yourself. Uh, in other words, I've got a problem. I'm going to go to God's word. And the ability to apply it, that's wisdom. So Solomon had all this knowledge. He knew exactly how God wanted him to live. He just didn't do it. It's so sad. It's a, it's a tragic end. It did not have to be like that. Uh, one author, Ken Ba, wrote, no, knowledge is knowing the right thing to do. Wisdom's actually doing it. True wisdom is seen through an obedient life, obedient to God and to his word. So I'll, I'll, if, you, if you're into math, I would say it this way. Wisdom equals knowledge plus obedience. Wisdom equals knowledge plus obedience. You can know all, all the whole Bible. You can, you can have the whole thing memorized. In fact, there are many people who have memorized a lot of the Proverbs in book of Proverbs. And I, I love being around those kind of people. Uh, there, something comes up in life and they just say, well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Like they just know it. They, they've memorized a lot of these Proverbs. But you, you can have them all memorized, but it's not going to make any difference in your life unless you apply it, unless you obey God and, and, and live the way that he's calling you to live. In the New Testament, in the book of James, chapter 1, uh, verse 5 says, if you need wisdom, Ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. If you need wisdom, ask God. That's where our wisdom comes from. A little bit later in the same chapter, though, it's kind of the bookend. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling or deceiving yourself. If you, if you read God's word every day, but you don't live it? My friend, you are deceived. I am deceived if I do that. We're only fooling ourselves. And it's, it's so easy to just say, man, I read the Bible every day. I'm good. But actually what we need to do is say, I live and love the Bible. And we, that's, that's, that's one of our phrases here. We live and love the Bible. It's not enough just to know it. You got to live it. So why don't we do that? Why don't we just apply God's word every day in our lives? We just finished a Bible study in our, our, our groups, our Hope and Life groups, called Live No Lies. And one of the things that they talked about in that Bible study, and we learned that so many times the enemy, the devil, has, has, has spoken lies to us, and we believe those lies because they play to our disordered desires. And then they become normalized into society. We just think, well, that, that must be true. Everybody's doing it. Everybody thinks it. It must be true. Why, have, why, do we, why are we there? Why do we get there as a society? 
we've lost our fear of God. Society is not bowing their knee to God. Society is thumbing our noses at God and saying, God, maybe you were fine way back when, but now we got this. You, you can just take off, God, because we know how to live. We're much more enlightened. We're much more ed- educated. And that is so tragic because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One leads to good judgment. So then the re- natural result is poor judgment. That, that's what comes from turning away from God. If you would cultivate a healthy, reverential awe of God and a respect of God, you would feel God's peace when you need to make a decision. When you come to a crossroads in life, when, when you're, you're tempted to do something, when you are afraid, like everything would change if you would simply return to your fear of God. When you hold God in awe, you realize, well, my problems are not that big compared to God. They might be big compared to your ability, but they're not big compared to God. The thing is, when you follow God, you have a standard. You have a, you have something solid that you can go to. At the very minimum, with every decision you make, start here. God said, love God and love people. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you just started right there, wow, we would all be a lot ahead. And that is just the wisdom of God. If we would only recapture our fear of God as a society, man, the Lord makes you wise when you fear him and walk in his ways. Amen? Amen. He wants to show you how to live a wise and self-disciplined, successful life. Would you stand to your feet? I'd love to just pray for you. Would you bow your heads with me if you would? And online, pray with us too. Lord, we want to be successful. We want to have a happy life. We want to have great relationships. We, We want to have abundant finances and plenty to share. We want to be a blessing to the people around us. And so, Lord, I just pray that today you would help us to return to a healthy awe, a healthy fear, a reverence for you, God. And, Lord, I just want to thank you right now. You are bigger than our problems. You are bigger than our questions. You are the answer that we need. Jesus, you are the one greater than Solomon, whose name means peace. You are our peace. Jesus, you are the wisdom of God. We want you. We want you, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that not only today, but as we, as we go through this book of Proverbs, Lord, I pray for your wisdom. Lord, just like Solomon prayed a long time ago, Lord, I pray, how can we know how to live in this crazy world? How can we know what our identity is personally? How can we know how to treat people? How can we know what decisions to make if you don't teach us, Lord? And so, Lord, I pray that you would. Lord, make us wise. I pray for wisdom. Lord, I pray for just a a baptism of wisdom, Lord, on our lives. And I pray to the point that our workmates, our classmates, our neighbors, our family would say, wow, where did you get that wisdom? And we could say, I fear God. I respect God, and I got it from his word. Lord, teach us. Make us wise. And I pray, Lord God, that we would all thrive, that we would flourish, especially in our walk with you, Lord. Lord, I I pray, Lord God, change us, transform us from the inside out. And with your head still bowed, I'm just wondering if there are some of you who have not made the decision yet to give Jesus your faith give him your life. And I want to invite you online or in the room to put your faith in Jesus to save you. Right now, everyone around you is just praying for you because we, we want to see everyone put their faith in Jesus. How do you do that? You turn away from your sin. We are all born in sin. You turn your life over to Jesus and you say, you lead, Lord. I bow my knee to you. I'll stand in awe of you. Do you want to do that today? 
Do you want to put your faith in Jesus to become a Christian? Maybe you're coming back to him after wandering away, or maybe you've just never given your life to Jesus. If you want to do that today, would you raise your hand? And that will just tell me, Pastor, pray for me. I'm making that decision today. Online, you can raise your hand to God, and he can see you right where you are. If today you're making that decision, I want to lead you in a prayer. And uh, would you just repeat after me? And we're going to join with you to support you. We're all going to pray that together. But if you today are putting your faith in Jesus, would you pray this right to God? Let's pray it out loud. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and live by your wisdom starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you put your faith in Jesus, we've got a great online course that is just for you to to help you to move in closer and to follow God better. We'll tell you a little bit more about that. God bless you.